Oh, hi. <laughs> Welcome to Town Meeting Television. I'm here joined today by Patrick Standen, lecturer in philosophy at St. Michael's College. Yes. And we're going to talk about public philosophy week. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. So Delighted tell me, here. yeah, great, thanks. Tell me a little bit about what Public Philosophy Week is. I think it's just passed, but it's been around for a f you've been around for a few years. Is that right? Yes, yeah. it has. Yeah, yeah. It uh, Public Philosophy, uh, as it's practiced locally, is a, a venture of several philosophy departments uh, from local colleges: Middlebury, UVM, St. Michael's and uh, professors of philosophy and public intellectuals essentially take philosophy out of the formal uh, academic setting and bring it into pubs and libraries and uh, places of public access to share uh, philosophy and the love of knowledge and to talk about ideas and to engage in conversation about any number of issues. It's really uh, the uh, calendar of events and topics that is offered every year is amazing. Um, uh, Tyler Doggett, a professor of philosophy, is really our local champion for public philosophy. And uh, it's part of a larger movement that uh, really sort of came out of uh, England in a way of bringing philosophy out of the sort of formal academic environment and uh, you know, philosophy in many ways is, is a birthright for every human, right? That we're all capable of thinking and uh, we all have that wonder, uh, that curiosity to know and learn. So it sort of builds on that notion. Uh, and it's essential part of philosophy that um, probably was ignored for much of the 20th century because of the specialization of academic philosophy. But philosophy's always been part of the public, part of uh, societies, part of communities. You know, uh, Socrates, of course, was a, a, a man of the marketplace who would go around asking questions of everyone. So, you know, in that sense, it, it's, uh, it's an attempt to sort of just put philosophy back where it belongs not in the, you know, the, the, the classroom. It certainly belongs there, but not exclusively so. But let's um, philosophy come out and, and engage ideas in the, in the, in the real world. Um, outside of public philosophy week, so when I think of philosophy, I think of like books, abstract thinking, yeah. old guys. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, dead, yeah, dead, of, dead white males, right? Well, yeah, yeah, or, yeah so yeah. T like, Philosophy, the study of knowledge, the study of learning, the study of... Yeah, and, and I, I think that um, that estimation of philosophy stems from what has been going on in the 20th century where philosophy became a very specialized and arcane discipline that was only the province of a few really intelligent um, people and these people, of course, because of the particular quirky nature and privileges of the 20th century, were almost always white, almost always wealthy, almost always male. Who are the people that come to mind? Um, in that sense, you're, I'm thinking of you know uh, a lot of analytical philosophers out of the British and American tradition. So um, Bertrand Russell, A.J. Ayer, uh, Gilbert Ryle, these are the big names of 20th century philosophy that nobody knows because they're working in such uh, uh, narrow uh, areas of knowledge. You know, what is knowledge? And uh, you know, Bertrand Russell might be an exception to that because he was a public intellectual. Uh, but philosophy, prior to that and after that, and there always during that time period has had a, a presence in the public realm. And just returning back to that is in a way it's homecoming uh, because philosophy comes from uh, the streets. And we've, we've seen different periods throughout history. You know, you're thinking, I'm thinking particularly of, uh, you know, uh, um, ancient Athens when you had Socrates and Plato and Diogenes and Aristotle and uh, um, Epicurus uh, um, engaging public discourse and talking to politicians and uh, average people. Uh, throughout history, the French Revolution, the American Revolution, uh, conquered in the 1840s, um, uh, the streets of Paris uh, in the 1960s, philosophy uh, was public in those areas in those times, and it certainly is 
uh, happening again, and there's a lot more of it. So I think taking it out of that 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 realm and that realizing the philosophy is something for everyone. Yeah. Do you see besides um, so public philosophy week? Just back to that, and you can bring up the web page so folks can see that and see where you can go. Um, there's no power for change greater than a community discovering what it cares about. Right. It's one of the quotes on that. Mm -hmm. um, do we see a place where, do you see, besides something like this, where it's academics or community leaders bringing things out into the street, do you see a kind of philosophy emerging from the milieu of like social media and TikTok and YouTube and the the ways that we're interacting now. Yeah, well, there's certainly, you know, using those as media to um, investigate ideas, to share information, to learn um, our, you know, vital parts and sort of the original reasons why we had the growth of social media. And, uh, and, and I think they still can be viable alternatives. And certainly uh, coming up from, um, um, you know, the, the wider audiences, there's a lot of ideas. I mean, there's a currency for engaging ideas about politics and uh, economics and, you know, what, you know, and then looking even critically at what is social media. Um, I was uh, amazed at how when recently the uh, state university system decided to uh, um, empty their library of books and yeah. the, it was the, the um, the pushback came back from students and and they were saying, no, you know, we don't want any more social media. We want books, you know, right? And yeah. so, you know, uh, you know, that's that's kind of the sort of verve and enthusiasm and, and independence of mind that, you know, philosophy strives to uh, encourage. And uh, and 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 then philosophy, you know, this this week. Uh, a dedicated week of uh, thinkers and specialists and uh, uh, philosophers coming out of the classroom to share knowledge and to lead discussions and conversations, um, you know, is hopefully uh, planting the seed for this growth where people will form study groups and get together and uh, do pub philosophy and, um, you know, start, start doing it on their own. Yeah. What was the, what was the turnout like? It was good. It was good. You know, there are events all over Vermont, and the the topics range. I mean, they go mm -hmm. from um, you know food to community engagement. Yeah, to, we can scroll through those you know, if you want, Stephen. And, you can open that up and. Yeah, it's amazing the 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 richness and diversity and the breadth of what's being offered, just in a small state like Vermont. And um, you know, when you look at the calendar, it happens every year, usually toward the end of April um, and uh, beginning of May. And uh, finding the calendar and looking and, and and finding what's of interest to you. And I'm sure that there's going to be something that would spark uh, your interest. So. Um, I'm I'm curious, you, you mentioned the uh, state library system removing the books, which right. was, um, what do we call that? We, which, which the pushback was successful. It was. It's not gonna happen. Um, but what, in your experience, is happening with philosophy in higher ed? Yeah, um, philosophy in higher ed is going through uh, a, a, a growth period. We're seeing uh, more students come to uh, colleges and universities considering philosophy minors and majors. Oh, wow. Uh, there's growth in the field. We see a great amount of success. Uh, we see a lot of interdisciplinary growth. Uh, students are leaving uh, philosophy programs, graduating and going into uh, a number of different fields. Uh, we see that... Uh, uh, you know, many um, CEOs and, and, and heads of businesses and industries are looking at philosophy majors as vital members of their teams because they can uh, uh, argue well, they can think clearly, they can write well, uh, because there's just some of the skills you're going to get from philosophy and you can export those types of skills to any field. Uh, of course, there's always the traditional fields where philosophers and philosophy students tend to uh, shine and that's in law and medicine. Philosophy is the number one um, degree taken in law school and I think it's the number one non-science degree taken in medical schools hmm. as well. So so you're finding philosophers. Why, Why is that? What do you think what's behind that? I think what it is is a, uh, philosophy requires you to uh, 
uh, read carefully, to learn to think critically, to argue well, to speak well, and, and the result is that you can uh, typically succeed in those arenas in that, uh, because of those skills. Yeah. I feel like it has a real abstract quality as well, to be able to like zoom out and look at something from a kind of global, three-dimensional yeah. yeah. landscape view. Yeah. It is, it is, there's no doubt about that, but um, it, it, it's, 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 it's about you know, taking that global perspective and coming back into the, you know, the, the small too and going back and forth mm -hmm. and moving into those. I mean, uh, a vestige of that is that if you get a PhD in any subject today, whether it's in English literature or biochemistry, you're getting a doctorate of philosophy. Mm. And when you study a, a discipline thoroughly, you're looking at the foundations of that and uh, the theoretical underpinnings of it. So and that's the abstract aspect to it. But philosophy is also about just um, you know, how do you live your life? You know, how do we invest power in the society? Who controls power? Uh, you know, what is art? What is beauty? Um, uh, what is the right thing to do? I mean, I think any engaged uh, citizenry uh, needs to be well informed and critically minded and, and thoughtful and philosophy is a, is a discipline that can encourage that. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, big, uh, one of the biggest problems that philosophy is facing in the academy today is representation, and it's doing a great job bringing in more women philosophers, uh, uh, persons of color, people from different language groups and traditions and cultures, and um, and that's a wonderful welcome antidote to the um, large um, the dominance of the 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 white male perspective of of academic philosophy throughout mm -hmm. the 20th century. Because it's certainly not just a Western concept. Oh, right. No, yeah. not at all. And in, in fact, um, quite the opposite, right? Because, you know, there's, you, you know, when you study a, a course in philosophy, you typically begin in the ancient Middle East and North Africa, and uh, you're talking about cultures and traditions that are far removed from uh, the modern world. Of course, the Western tradition did build on many of those, but. Um, it's wrong-headed to think that it moved in a linear past, uh, uh, manner because it, it went, you know, perhaps the metaphor more useful would be kind of a fractal pattern going in all different directions. And, and it's always uh, governed by dialogue and conversation and argument. So, um, you know, there are uh, Greek philosophers who were dialoguing with Buddhist philosophers. Uh, there were uh, great contributions that are made by philosophers from Africa and Asia and native and indigenous traditions around the world. And, you know, philosophy today is becoming more open to those. And I think there's, they're also looking at the limitations of the traditional Western analytical model, which certainly has its place, but is also um, needs to be complemented and supplemented. So we're gonna get to your talk, but I just have one question. Sure. Is, is there like an original philosopher? Is there the, the first in your, in, is there somebody who's considered like the first philosopher? Yeah, well, the, you know, a lot of people turn to Socrates. Oh, uh, interesting. Socrates. Even though he's not yeah. the most ancient philosopher. Yeah, right, okay. yeah. And you know, I mean, uh, uh, in, in the Western tradition, um, and many sort of global philosophies look towards an ancient Turkish philosopher by the name of Thales, who grew up in the island of Miletus um, uh, in, on the, um, in the Mediterranean. And he, uh, he questioned the mythopoetic worldview, the, the idea that gods did everything. And mm. he started to uh, think about things. And uh, the, the story goes that he had visited Egypt and had looked at the Egyptian uh, astronomical records and discerned a pattern about eclipses. And when he came back home to Miletus, he, he uh, uh, told his friends that a, an eclipse is gonna happen in a few uh, weeks or something like that. And uh, of course his friends didn't believe him because they all were saying, well, that's, that would be the agency of the, the gods and, and the eclipse did happen. And instead of you know um, perhaps you know sacrificing goats or or, or sheep or whatever, um, they started to look and say, well, you could rationally know these kinds of things. And I think that that is often seen as the origin of philosophy, at least as um, in an academic sense, because what you're doing is using human reasoning to try to figure things out. Mm. You know, all humans um, love that to know. That sounds like a toddler. 
Yeah, that, that is exactly right. <laughs> I, I, in my philosophy classes, I start with a story. I, I, yeah. I tell my students to imagine a, you know, a, 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 a dad putting his little, uh, maybe a four or five year old daughter to bed on a, you know, cold winter's night, and you know, and the, the daughter happens to look out her window and see the the moon and asks her dad, you know, what is that? You know, and let's think, dad's a smart guy, so he says, oh, that's the moon. And, uh, it, it, you know, anybody with a child is going to know what's going to happen next because the child says, Daddy, what's the moon? Uh -huh. And, you know, Daddy's probably going to be smart enough to say, well, it's a large planetary body that uh, goes around the Earth. And, you know, then, of course, the child's going to say, you know, body, what's that? Uh -huh. <laughs> right? And, and then, then eventually Dad's going to say, well, go to sleep, right? Uh -huh. And I think what has happened to so many of us is that we've been in that position where we've been told to stop asking questions. Uh -huh. And in a way, philosophers are still children, right? They've been able to keep that uh, little spark, that insatiable curiosity alive, uh -huh. right? And then what philosophers love to do is we love to share that. We, you know, we, uh, we're committed with um, bringing life back into the uh, the minds of peoples, you know, the, you know, because the adult world, the larger world, has probably told them to not ask questions and, and not rock the boat, and and uh, and, and and you know, we try to uh, get people to uh, turn those, uh, you know, that that fire inside them into a conflagration again, yeah. right? To, to, so philosophers are good for democracy. Which I, kind I of think gets so. To your talk, I, absolutely. Epistemic injustices, yes. philosophy, and listening as social change. Tell yeah. us a little bit about yeah. your. Well, it, that was your presentation. That was my talk this year, and 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 I have to point out that you know, uh, like so many other things, we took a, a, a you know a, a, a time off during the pandemic, and now we're back, and and so uh, look for us again next year. And and uh, my talk uh, this year was on epistemic injustice and. Epistemic injustice is a really important um, movement in uh, philosophy, pioneered by a number of women philosophers, including uh, the British American philosopher Miranda Fricker, who um, she call it epistemic justice. Yeah, well, it okay. is. Yeah, 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 and and so uh, you know what it is is essentially that when we think about an injustice done to a person, like a harm done to a person, um, we typically think about it in terms of physical harm. You know, I, you know, I, um, I, I do something to you and it hurts and, and, and uh, you cry foul and you seek some kind of remedy. And, and, and that's a very limited way of thinking about it because a lot of harm that is done to people is done to their ideas, their mind, and uh, their knowledge. And when philosophers talk about knowledge, they're using the um, the word epistemology or epistemic, which comes from the ancient Greek uh, episteme, which means knowledge. And uh, and and how epistemic justice and injustice works is when someone does a wrong to you as a knower, and uh, and and that is a fundamental moral wrong, because what it does is it undermines you, diminishes you as a knower, and then it um, it. It, it silences you and prevents you either sharing your perspective and your knowledge um, or uh, continuing along your growth. And so the example that Miranda, Miranda Fricker uses in her, in her work is how, um, say in the 1940s and 50s, women ha were subject to sexual harassment in the, in the, in the um, uh, world of employment, but they, they didn't have the concept for sexual harassment. So they might have just said, well, I don't, I feel uncomfortable about this, but I don't know why, or, um, you know, he's just trying to be, uh, he's just flirting with me or something like that. And with the rise of feminism um, and the development of this particular concept of uh, idea, uh, we had this notion of sexual harassment. So a person could, could say it. So what would have happened in that world um, before those concepts were available, uh, the woman who was being harassed, um, you know, and she might have uh, kept silent, right? And so imagine, you know, if she had an idea and uh, she might be undermined by it, right? Um, people wouldn't listen to her. And, and this happens all the time. It happens to, um, you know, uh, people who are typically marginalized in a society. And that, what that wrong is done is it undermines you as a knower. Right, you're, you're, the value of what you're saying and what you you know is being diminished 
by someone who is claiming that, well, what you're saying doesn't matter or you mm -hmm. can't mean it. So, you know, women during that time period were often said, well, you're being emotional, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, um, and, um, and, and what happens is that when you have the, the terms, the ideas, the knowledge to defend, and then you start to listen, then um, you're laying the groundwork for that knowledge to be shared, and you're and you're essentially endorsing that person's position, right, and avoiding any kind of harm, right. So you know, whenever you know we. Um, you know, we don't listen to children or persons of color or persons with disabilities. You know, we say, well, that can't be the case. You don't know what you're talking about. You know, it's often going to undermine the knower, the person articulating that position. Mm -hmm. And so what Marinda Fricker does is she suggests there's some ways that we can um, develop in our society to prevent that from happening by listening to the testimonies of those who are are, ha are there to have and are offering their own epistemic uh, or, or knowledge-based um, uh, experience. And so what uh, we learn- Epistemic learned... means experience, meaning- Well, it really right? means it's knowledge. Like knowledge. Yeah, yeah. But is it born of, born of seeing, knowing, I mean, yeah, born it's, of what? <laughs> it, it's born of your perspective, yeah, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's, it, it, you're being in the world, your yeah. engagement with the world. Yeah. And so in, in that sense, um, you know, we, you know, there might be an absolute truth out there, but we all are looking at it from our own perspectives, yeah. our own point of view. Yeah. And so uh, your position becomes valuable because of the unique perspective that you have. Uh, and for someone to discount that perspective merely because uh, of some identity that you've subscribed to becomes a case of epistemic injustice. So epi epistemic injustice is usually, injustice as it usually occurs, is that some, you're going, your knowledge is discounted merely because you have an identity as a woman, as a person of color, as a person with a disability, as a, as a different language speaker. Think for example, another example might be how we discount people who have certain accents, mm. right? Mm. Um, and you know, uh, uh, conversely, we attach way too much importance to other kinds of accents, right? So, you know, an, an Oxbridge accent, you know, the Oxbridge Cambridge mm -hmm. um, st um, standard English, uh, you know, whatever people say when they say it in that way, is it, we attach more significance and importance to it, and, and those are biases, right? right? And so, becoming aware of those and biases and trying to prevent them from happening will um, enable those people who might have something very important to say, and it, it's, it might be very legitimate and uh, important for that knowledge to become part of the social discourse to actually have yeah. and be heard. Yeah, so you know the the importance of curiosity, the importance of seeking understanding when you're met with something that is um, contrary to your experience, your learned understanding and experience. But I'm curious, in the current conversation on free speech, how this relates because it's you know it gets um, you know we have. You know, here in Town Meeting TV studios, folks come in, and you know, for example, there was a program recently that um, where some folks were discussing issues um, around stickering in the community and free speech, but the words and language used to back up those political um, um, ideologies, the political way of thinking. Mm -hmm were really kind of hurtful and hateful and sort of ignorant. And so in that ignorance is also born a discounting. In this case, it was a trans ignorance. You know, mm -hmm. it was ignorance around the experience, the lived experience of trans people. Right. And, and hurtful and hateful. So right, those three sort of things. Mm -hmm. And it, it begins to bring into question even just the very being of the studio that we're sitting in, which, which stands for free speech. Mm -hmm and yet harms members of our community. Right. And right. it you know, it makes us sort of wrestle with the philosophies that underpin the work that we do here. I wonder if you have thoughts on that. Yeah. Well, and the wrestling is really good. Mm -hmm. Right. Um Miranda Fricka is a guide here too because she points out that, you know, some experiences are just illegitimate, right? That there's there's, you know, 
uh, if you're, you know, your, your, your three-year-old or your five-year-old child's not going to be able to speak very eloquently about, um, you know, about um, how to fix the car or, you know, you know, you know, about a medical procedure or something like that. So, so you know, we there are ways of assessing, you know, the the content of 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 language and of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, if you have a, a a severe pain in the head, you're not going to give your friend a scalpel and tell them to open it up. You're going to go to a a doctor, hopefully. If your car's broken down, you're 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 probably going to go to a certified mechanic and. And um, what I think w there's a tendency to do is to, uh, while we should always be critical and uh, of authority, there is legitimate authority, and uh, and that happens in free speech too, right? So um, I think free speech is uh, is only free when it's not going to harm someone, and um, in a way. Um, you always have to ask yourself, what are the reasons for you saying it? What are the effects of you saying it? Um, uh, is, is what you're about to say going to m make the world a better place? Is it going to build uh, community? Uh, is it going to enable a person to flourish? Or is it going to do the opposite? And, you know, and, I, and I think that kind of self a uh, reflective stance, which is something that you would develop in philosophy and also just in lived experience, is something that's missing in, in current discourse. I mean, why, why do you feel it's important to put up a sign, uh, a sticker, or um, make a claim that members of your community are telling you is hurtful? Mm -hmm. And, and in, in a way, what that when that happens, you, you're seeing an epistemic injustice because what the person is doing, if they're putting up, say, a transphobic sticker, they're undermining the knowledge of the trans members of your community, right? And um, and, and and I think that that's a, a way of starting and you have to go through a process of self-reflection and ask yourself, well, you know, why are people being, uh, uh, you know, why do they view this as hurtful? And, and then that becomes a, a process of self-engagement because you're saying, you know, perhaps there's something about what I'm saying that um, is hurtful, is wrong. So do is we wrong. bring in a component of, do we bring in a component of power and privilege here? You know, so I think about folks in the police forces who said, well, I feel hurt. That's why I want to say blue lives matter. I want to say black, li you know, I want to say all lives matter because, you know, this, I feel hurt. I feel, mm -hmm. you know, and you go like, do, mm -hmm. do we listen to that? Yeah. Is, this, is this one of those places where we talk about power and privilege in relationship to, yeah, and it, if we're getting too far off, you no, know, yeah. No, is, it's yeah. Cer it certainly is. And, uh, um, you know, and, you know, it, it's, a, it's a universal platitude that all lives matter. And they do, yeah. but um, you know the the exigency of the moment requires us to look at Black Lives because um, when um, our, our our servicemen and women, our police officers, um, you know, go for a drive in the you know they don't have to wonder whether they're going to be pulled over and shot or or or, or uh, harassed, right? Um, um, th they may feel uncomfortable, and uh, and the discomfort might be something that comes with the position, and and um, and they might be better people because of that um, that that process of discomfort that they're going to go through. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, I I I, th I I think that wrestling with these kinds of ideas, these experiences, are important. Listening, of course. But one can always disagree too, and one can say, "Well, you you have a position, but your position is being uh, tempered by you know these other positions." I mean, I think the the, the early on in the debate over Black Lives Matter, um, free speech, and and uh, and and so forth, I think one of the things that uh, the examples that that I thought was very uh, helpful was the idea of. You know, if, if if there's a fire burning in a house, you you know you're not going to put water on all the other houses that aren't burning. You're trying uh -huh. to put out the, the the fire in the particular house that's burning, and that's the issue at hand that we have to work with, right? And um, and that's when we get into. I I want to I do want to 
talk a little bit about your role on the new Truth and Reconciliation Commission before we run out. Sure. Because we're about to, speaking about truth, we're about to get into the realm of whose truth is truth. Right, and yeah, so, yeah, right. yeah. Well, it is, it's certainly, Which, an, it, know, it's like, an outgrowth of my yeah. training in philosophy, my social advocacy, my work in epistemic injustice, but it's also, um, I, I teach disability studies and the philosophy of disability and, and medical ethics, and so it grows out of those concerns as well. And so um, Tell us about what's Act 128 and the yeah, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Yeah, so the state recently uh, um, passed a, 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 a bill that created Vermont's first Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which is charged with looking into the state-sponsored injustices that have been visited upon citizens and marginalized groups in Vermont's history. And these include, of course, the first people here, the Abenaki, but also the um, French Canadians, uh, French Indians, uh, persons with disabilities, um, and uh, and 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 others, and certainly members of the BIPOC community. We we know we know now, of course, that while slavery was outlawed formally in the Constitution, it was still. Uh, de facto practiced around, um, you know, throughout the 19th century. And so um, those wrongs uh, that have been visited upon those uh, individuals have created the historic inequities that lead to the institutional inequalities that we see today. And so uh, the state issued an apology uh, re regarding the eugenics period in Vermont's history. And from that and other discussions around um, um, looking at justice with the Abenaki, uh, with um, injustices done to our members of our black and BIPOC communities. Um, there developed a, a, a long dialogue in the state legislature that culminated in the creation of this bill. And so uh, three uh, commissioners, uh, my, myself, uh, um, uh, Mia Schultz and um, Melody uh, Mack and Walker have been uh, chosen to lead the commission, and we're tasked with uh, staffing the commission and hiring an executive director, historical researcher, uh, legal counsel, and um, administrative assistants and, and, and interns to start doing the hard work of uh, documenting these instances of abuse, both historic and more recent. With the goal of? The goal is um, to provide the legislature with recommendations on how to address and perhaps remedy and, and seek to um, begin the process of, of recovery and healing uh, from these wrongs. Uh, what those rep recommendations look like at this point, uh, we don't know because we, we have to go through the process of documenting and listening to those stories. And then uh, from those stories and listening to those communities, we can see uh, what they think would be appropriate in that sense. Uh, certainly some degree of reparations or public apologies or, or even using this information to inform our educational curriculum at the, at the school level um, may well be uh, things that we might be offering. And of course, we're just going to make these um, recommendations. Uh, the the legislature is not duty bound to follow them. Yep. Um, and we've just begun. We've yeah. just begun. We've just begun the work. And right, we're just like a, a month ago. Or a month right? exactly. Yeah, and yeah. what's been the response so far to that? It's been, there, there's been a tremendous outpouring of support. There's been a lot of criticism, which is expected too. Um, we've been dialoguing with people from all over the, uh, the globe, including uh, members of Truth and Reconciliation Commissions out of Canada, Maine, Peru, South Africa, and points farther abroad, who have been so helpful and forthcoming with offering us advice and recommendations and their, uh, their wisdom on how to uh, uh, build a successful and efficient uh, commission. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, of the most, some of the, the one of the most famous one was certainly after apartheid. Indeed. And that, yeah. is that when you first cut your teeth in sort of the political realm? Is It certainly UVM? was for me. But yeah, UVM back in the 1980s and, yeah. and Shantytown. So it's a really and, full circle to bring what you learned it is. as a young person. It is. And it's, you know, I was yeah. really fortunate in that um, after UVM, I went to 
graduate school in Boston, and I happened to um, be able to be there in, uh, in the front row uh, listening to Nelson Mandela uh, right after he was freed from his imprisonment in Robben Island. Um, Boston, Massachusetts actually was one of the first places he visited. Um, and, and, and so that's a, a large component of my own story of intellectual growth. And uh, so it does feel uh, appropriate and, and uh, fitting in, in, in my story to be involved with this. And I, I, I'm- Here we I'm, have a philosopher involved in public politics and democracy. Indeed, which is exactly indeed. Yeah. where you want to be. Yeah, exactly. It's that, 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 that pub public realm to it. Uh, yeah. yeah, it fits nicely. So. Yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and, and I've also been heartened by just the outpouring of people uh, from those communities that we're going to be looking at, too. They've provided information, and uh, so it's just been a, uh, a whirlwind of uh, meeting uh, stakeholders and, and persons, and it's been a, a very educational process, and hopefully as we go forward to um, choose our staff, and uh, you know, we'll uh, continue this, this, this great, important work. Well, thanks for being here today. I think we just sort of scratched the surface. There's so much more, big, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, and uh, people can always reach out to me in my campus email um, and uh, learn more about public philosophy or, or contact uh, Tyler Doggett at, at UVM. Or yep. We also have a public philosophy website. It's on social media as well. Yep, so we shared it um, great. on the yeah shared it on the screen as well. Super. And there'll be another one next year. And Indeed. We'll Indeed. cover some of those events. With whole new topics. Yeah. So, All so. right. Well, thanks for watching, folks. Um, we're going to wrap up now. And thanks to Pat Trick Stanman for coming in. You're welcome. Um, and joining us. And uh, keep walking, watching and keep uh, thinking. Yes.